Hi, I'm attorney Gregory Dell, joined here with attorney Stephen Jessup, and we're going to talk about the services that we offer to help people with long-term disability insurance appeals following a denial. Now, Steve, the people who are on our website now and watching this video have found themselves in a position where they've been denied their long-term disability benefits, and specifically here we're going to talk more about the ERISA long-term disability denials because we also handle the private disability denials and we have a separate section of our website which we talk about the private disability denials but this is specific towards the ERISA appeal and I want people to know what they what they should expect um, we have other videos where we provide tips on how to handle an appeal but this is really about how we help a claimant and what we're gonna want when they call us and what we need so that we can guide them and help them through this whole process so let's get right into it and what's the first thing that you're gonna need when someone calls you and says look I've been denied my long-term disability benefits the denial letter I mean the denial letter under the law the insurance company has to explain the policy language they applied how the review was done and, and the rationale and basis for the denial and then there's always going to be standard language about what your appeal rights are under ERISA. So that denial letter in a lot of ways is almost like the sneak preview uh, as to what's in your claim file. So generally with that denial letter, we're able to determine if we can assist, to what extent we can assist, where a lot of the roadblocks may be, issues with the policy, uh, the medical information. So that denial letter is really the key uh, to our ability to determine if we can even assist someone. Now, we've both handled thousands of these uh, long-term disability appeals and probably reviewed tens of thousands of denial letters. Are they all written the same, these denial letters? In a lot of ways, yes. You know, it's, it's, it's always the same basic. Uh, each company has their own way about going out their reviews and the denials. So you start to see a lot of, this, a lot of similarities. It's, it's very rare at this point I'm surprised by some basis of denial. We've usually seen them all at this point. So it's pretty standard in how each company may go about things, but then there's always nuances compared to what the job was, what the medical conditions are. So even though there's an overarching theme that may be similar, the actual facts are as specific and individual as, as a person. So, uh, you know, it really gets a little more into it there. And when a person receives this denial letter and then you have the opportunity to review it, which they can email us by submitting a free consultation request, how quickly are you able to determine whether or not you can help them? Probably within the, uh, by not even finishing the letter uh, in that, like I said, the end of it is usually a lot of the form legal language. Um, you know, getting to the heart of it, policy language, making sure that coverage is there. Um, obviously, if it's something like a pre-existing condition denial, a lot of times there's not much that we're able to do with that. But generally speaking, just a review of that letter, I can know whether or not it's something we can assist with. Okay. So the letter is just scratching the surface. Then there's this thing known as the claim file, which all of the denial letters say you have the right to request your claim file. And a lot of people mistakenly get misled into just going ahead and submitting a reply letter which they think is their appeal letter saying I disagree with your decision and you were wrong and tell them five different reasons why they were wrong and 99% of the time those people lose mm -hmm. because that's not the right way to do an appeal it's not how we do an appeal but start with what is the claim file why do you have to get it and then let's talk about what we do once we get a claim file in order to submit a strong appeal letter yeah like I said the denial letter is like a sneak preview to the claim file um, a lot of times they'll cherry pick medical records and the uh, denial letters to support it. That claim file is everything in your, in your file. Anything that you or your doctors have submitted or the insurance company has created, their internal notes, all that. So you get to see all the information. As unfair as ERISA can be in so many ways, you're at least afforded the ability to see everything they have against you. Um, so you can be able to prepare what your response is going to be. And, you know, like you said, with people who sometimes, you know, do it too quickly or get tricked into, you know, they'll say, oh, you just have to write a letter explaining why you disagree. Um, that can be a huge, huge mistake. Uh, you know, like 99% of the time. So the claim file allows us to break apart and see everything from vocational to medical to underlying coverage who they had review it, all the, you know, inside the, their mind, so you know exactly what information you're going to need to, you know, make the strongest appeal. Okay. So this claim file, there's no charge to get it. The mm -hmm. disability insurance company is obligated to give it to the claimant. More often than not, it's a minimum of a thousand pages. We've had them as much as 20,000 pages. Just depends how long a person's been on claim. Every company does their claim file in a different matter. More often than not, they're completely disorganized. It's a box of papers or it's a PDF that you have to go through and we're looking for 
you know, we know how to break them up. There's specific things. Often there's needle in the haystack type information. But once you get the claim file, do you then just go ahead and submit the appeal? Or what is the technique that we take from once we have the claim file until we submit our final appeal letter? So the way I do it, when someone hires me, the first thing we do is put the request out. They have 30 days to get us the claim file. Uh, during that time, now I'm already ordering medical records, uh, seeing if I can get additional testing scheduled, like really getting ahead of the curb and being able to get all of the, uh, the information that we're going to need for the appeal. Then when the, the claim file comes, you know, it's finding those, that information. Some carriers, like you said, will just put a box of papers. Now uh, we're seeing more where they'll email a link, but it's just a jumbled PDF. There's a lot of duplicate documents. Things aren't in any type of order whatsoever. Uh, even if they put a table of contents, it, it really only applies to them, not you. So we're looking, I'm looking for the important things, those medical reviews, those vocational reviews, um, because once I have someone's medical information or any additional testing I may want, then it's also coordinating with their doctors with all the information we've compiled to really go after those individual opinions in the medical reviews or sometimes getting you know, vocational, vocational experts involved as well. So the claim file, you just don't get it and submit your appeal. Um, that's just another piece of how you build your evidence for your appeal because ultimately the appeal is, is yes, it's a letter technically, but it's more what evidence you can provide. So the most important thing is, is creating and providing evidence of the disability. So I know in our office, we all have a strategy. We get the denial letter, we get the claim file, we tear it apart, and then we put in what we call the plan of attack. Mm -hmm. And this plan of attack, like you were touching on, is executing on really what additional evidence are we going to develop, and then taking that additional evidence and strategically writing a very strong appeal letter. But getting that evidence is really what I think, if you had to put a scale of what's the most important and you were going from like zero to 100%, I think that it's 85% obtaining that additional evidence and then the additional 15% would be in the strategy of how mm -hmm. you write that letter. So they give you six months to do an appeal and talk about why is it important to have that amount of time and the process of how you really work with claimants, their doctors and other experts to get this additional evidence. Yeah, you know, the six months, a lot of people, when there's no money coming in, that's a huge burden. But I always, you know, speak to any potential clients and I remind them initially when we were having that initial consultation on a denial letter that to understand the appeal, you have to understand the end, you know, lawsuits, what it means in litigation, what your rights are, you know, how your appeal is your last opportunity to submit any information that a judge can consider. So when you realize the magnitude of that appeal based on what's going to happen down the road, that six months isn't a whole heck of a lot of time to, to potentially try to secure decades worth of benefits. Um, so it's the, the evidence that you create for the, the appeal, like you said, it's, it's, it's building that um, because your medical records, those are already there. You know, things that have come before, you can't unring those bells, anything doctors may have put down wrong stuff in there, that's already there. So now it's creating the new information to prove to the insurance company and their doctors that your condition is impairing you. Um, it's really not so much as, well, I have this diagnosis, why aren't they paying me? Uh, I tell people all the time, common sense and logic doesn't seem to play. You still have to draw that nexus, you know, that here's your medical, here's what the definition of disability is, and proving how there's a, a link and correlation between those, you know, that the diagnosis doesn't equal disability alone. Right, and the biggest challenge is working closely with the doctors, because more often than not, when, when I see a lot of denials, it's because the doctor really doesn't understand the scope of the definition of disability, and they might have not articulated that appropriately or they got a phone call from the carrier or they wrote a letter and said yes the person can do some kind of activities of daily living but didn't understand that it's about can they go in eight hours a day five days a week reliably as a consistent employee and do their job and then when that gets communicated through us even speaking directly to the doctors then they understand then they communicate more appropriately then they start documenting more it could be we have clients who have to go back and see their doctor three four five times before we submit the appeal because we're building that story. Mm -hmm. And you just touched on it a minute ago about claimants need to understand their rights in a lawsuit. Not that we think we're gonna lose the appeal because certainly we wanna win our appeal and we win a lot of our appeals, but you have to start thinking about what if I lose this appeal? What is the standard that the court, how is the court gonna look at this? Because a lot of people think, well, if we lose the appeal, I'll get my day in court, I'll have my jury trial and 
you know, I'll get a fair shake. But really, the ERISA laws don't allow for a... No. A conventional a, a, idea of a trial. Right. You don't necessarily have your, um, day your day in court, your full rights. It's not a true due process type procedure. So talk about the process that comes after if you were and wh why that's a factor now. Because if you don't, how do you write the appeal such that you're considering the standard review and what's going to happen later? All right. So I guess we'll start with the standard review. The vast majority of time, it's what's known as an arbitrary and capricious standard. So if you submit your appeal, the appeal's denied. At that point, the claim file closes. No new information can be uh, come in for a court to consider. Uh, they're just going to look at that snippet in time from when the claim started to when it ended. Uh, it goes into federal court. And I want to just stop mm -hmm. you right there because that this is one of the most unique and one of the only areas of law I know about that once you submit an appeal at an administrative level and then it goes to court, you are done. It doesn't matter what happens to you. Nothing. You know? I mean, we always give the example, God forbid you submit your appeal, they deny you, and you get hit by a bus the next day where there's no questions asked that you can't work. It's not coming into evidence. It's everything that happened the day before they made that. And this is extremely rare and the only area, one of the only areas of law that yeah. that happens. Okay. And this is in large part because the court, right, so it goes to federal court, there's no juries, you don't testify, your doctors don't testify, no one from the insurance company will. Uh, a lot of times, the court just wants the attorneys to file motions, dispositive motions to make a decision on. And a judge has a two-step process, generally speaking. One, are you disabled? Is there enough medical evidence to even support the disability? And sometimes with, you know, going back to doctors, sometimes that even gets questionable because doctors don't want to get involved. Um, if the court finds that yes, you are medically disabled, goes to the second step, and that's whether your insurance company acted arbitrary and capricious which is more or less, you know, layman's term, did they have a reasonable basis to deny the claim? It's not a very high threshold for them. And an insurance company is setting up your denial with the thought of mind of, can we prove we provided reasonable review? Um, that's how they're viewing the way that they go about there. So you have to also as well. So when doing an appeal, like we said, evidence is the most important thing. It's that medical. And uh, uh, personally, I, I'm not quoting to case law. I may, you know, kind of like generally make some broad, like, you know, comments that may allude to some. Uh, but the problem is, is with this idea, if you're trying to show to a judge down the road that they acted unreasonable, if you tell them everything they did wrong in their appeal, all they got to do is check off those boxes. You know, oh, you didn't have this type of doctor look at it, or you failed to do this. Well, if they do those things on appeal and then they get the result that they want from right. them, then you've lost all that argument later in court. You don't have that leverage against them. So there's a real art in getting the appeal to provide and show the medical evidence clear, so clearly supports the disability without you know, showing your cards for what you may need in court down the road. So the, the key for me always is sh make the evidence so mm -hmm. strong that no reasonable doctor that they're gonna hire next on the appeal could disagree. Mm -hmm. And also you can dissect their prior medical review to make it look like it was so absolutely ridiculous exactly. that no matter who you get next down the road could not disagree. But yet at the same token, you can't tell them do this, this, and that. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, there's not many lawyers who focus and specialize in this area of the law and they write with legal case law and they tell the insurance company you did these 10 things wrong and guess what the insurance company does? They say, thank you very much for telling us everything. They rewrite a letter back and say, you told us these 10 things we looked into these 10 things, we did this, this, and that, we're still denying you, and then it goes to court and you really don't have much of a leg to stand on because how do you argue they didn't act reasonably? Yes, they didn't get the right conclusion because they didn't reverse, but it's still, you take away that argument that they didn't act reasonably, and then the claimant can't get the case reversed. So you have to be super strategic in how you draft that. And then once you put together all this stuff, and granted, we, I know it takes six months that you have six months, it doesn't take us yeah, exactly. six months. People have called us with two weeks left. Mm -hmm. We'll do the best we can. Obviously, the more time we have, the more that can get done. And hopefully you're someone who got your denial letter, you're calling us relatively quickly, and we'll jump on it right away. But it's not us that's necessarily taking the time so long to write the letter. It's more about what plan of attack can we put in place? What additional evidence can we get? When can you get to the doctors? Will your doctors cooperate? If it's not your current doctor, who are we going to get you to? Are we going to send you to a functional capacity exam? Are we going to hire a vocational consulting expert? So many different things that, that can be done. And the more time we have, the better, because you only get one shot. The appeal is the trial. Yep. So 
really want people to understand that. So um, thanks for scratching the surface here in terms of what we do. If you've been denied your long-term disability benefits, we would love for you to reach out to us with a copy of your denial letter. We will get on the phone with you immediately and go over if we think we can help you, let you know what we can do, let you know immediately what we charge. And touching on the basis of what we charge, we handle all of our appeals on a contingency fee basis, which means there's no fees or costs unless we win. So that takes a lot of pressure off a lot of people because people have no income coming in as it is and they think they're gonna have to spend thousands of dollars just to hire a lawyer with no guarantee that they're gonna win. So the contingency fee basis is our preferred way to work and very much appreciated by all of our clients. Also, no matter where you live in the country, we're available to assist you. So should you like us to review your file or you have any questions about your long-term disability denial, call Stephen, call myself, any of our lawyers, and we look forward to the opportunity to help you.